A very good afternoon to all of you on this wonderfully good, good Friday afternoon. And uh, I should really appreciate the enthusiasm with which all of you have come here, especially because today happens to be right in the middle of a very long weekend. And I hope that all of you were able to exercise your franchise in the national parliamentary elections yesterday. I would like to extend you all a very warm welcome, especially to those who have come from outside, including our alumni. We must extend a very cordial welcome to two of our speakers today, Professor Rajesh Sundareshan and Dr. Arunab Bhattacharya. I would like to extend a very special welcome to a very special person, Professor Anurag Kumar. As all of you know, today happens to be the third session of the Big Data Public Lectures that were initiated two months back. The first two talks were given by Professor Ravi Kannan and uh, Professor Ramesh Hariharan. So today, from today onwards, the sessions will, be, will feature back-to-back -back talks. So after Professor Ravi Kannan and Professor Ramesh Hariharan opened the batting, so today we have number three and number four. So we have uh, perhaps uh, Chiteshwar Pujara and Virat Kohli doing the batting today. And uh, I would like to first introduce uh, both the speakers. Our first speaker today will be Dr. Harana Bhattacharya. And second speaker will be Professor Rajesh Sundareshan. I will first introduce Professor Rajesh Sundareshan, our second speaker. Uh, Professor Rajesh is currently an associate professor at the Department of uh, ECE since 2005. And from 1999 to 2005, he was designing, uh, implementing, and also testing wireless modems at uh, Qualcomm. But before that, he had a fantastic uh, pedigree. Uh, he's a BTEC from IIT Madras, a PhD from Princeton University. And since 2005, he has been at the department of uh, ECE. His main areas of interest right now are communication network algorithms and uh, information theory. Recently, he has also made forays into network science and uh, game theory. I consider that uh, Professor Rajesh Sundaration is endowed with uh, very deep scholarship in all the areas that he works on. And today, he will be talking to us about some very interesting problems on belief propagation in large-scale optimization problems that arise on graphs. That is our second speaker for today. Our first speaker today is Dr. Harana Bhattacharya. He's currently an assistant professor at the Department of Computer Science and Automation. He works in the areas of theoretical computer science, and in particular, he works on algorithms. More recently, he has been interested in algorithms for big data. Uh, he is a BS. M. Inch and PhD, all from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And after that, he spent uh, postdocs, postdoc positions at the Princeton University and also at uh, Rutgers. So today he will be talking to us about uh, uh, spectral graph theory and graph partitioning. Uh, let's uh, first congratulate uh, Dr. Arnab Bhattacharya, who has just been awarded the Ramanujan Fellowship. And then we will invite him to deliver, deliver his talk on spectral graph theory and graph partitioning. Dr. Arnab. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Professor Narari, for the generous introduction. Uh, and thank you to all of you for being here on a holiday. And also, thanks to Shivani for inviting me to give a talk. Uh, so, my talk today will be about a particular approach for partitioning graphs called spectral partitioning. It's based on a way of looking at graphs that might look a little foreign to the uninitiated, 
and my goal will be to describe uh, the basis of this theory in a way that should be understandable without any uh, prerequisites. Yeah, so first of all, let me say why uh, a little bit about why uh, graphs are interesting in the context of big data. I think this does not really need to be said to this audience, but still let me go on. So one uh, of the, so graphs are useful whenever you have pairwise relations between objects. So, uh, so one example is uh, the, is in the domain that was the subject of the last talk in computational biology. So you have these different genes which have uh, relations among each other. So, if one gene is turned on, it activates another gene or it re might repress another gene and so on. And, uh, and this could be described by a graph, a big graph. And uh, one would like to do analysis on this graph. For example, one might like to uh, construct, uh, one might like to recover based on this graph uh, uh, functional components. So, groups of these genes which act together and have the same function. So, the question is, is this, I mean, is this sort of big question answerable just by looking at this graph? Another example is, um, comes from say underwater uh, cables. Oh, my phone. Oh. Sorry about that. Another example comes from underwater cables which are used for providing online access to people throughout the world. A terrorist might want to know what is the most cost effective way to disconnect a very heavily utilized region from others. Uh, turning towards business, here is one example that I found uh, online. So, this is a graph of who is suing who in the mobile business. So, this is taken from 2010. And you see this graph, there are even cycles in this graph. So, I think there is a, <laughs> yeah, Qualcomm and Nokia are both suing each other. Uh, so, one, again, one would like to do, I mean, one might like to do analytics on these types of graphs. Suppose one would try to construct, um, I mean, uh, given such a graph, is it possible to recover uh, groups of companies who are somehow acting together in concert? Final example is the example that is nowadays a must on any talk about uh, graphs and big data, social networks. Uh, so, uh, this is, uh, these are networks consisting of social relations among people. And these graphs themselves have very particular attributes. So, for example, one has this, um, uh, I mean these graphs generally have a small diameter. Uh, and again, uh, analytics on these graphs is a important task. For example, many people nowadays are concerned about recovering communities of people inside social networks. All right. So, uh, analytics on graphs being motivated, let me, well, uh, and lastly, let me talk about uh, a generalization of, uh, of social networks. So, one could consider similarity graphs. So, these are graphs which are, I mean, so they consist of objects. And then there is the, so for each pair of objects, one can put a weight which captures the similarity between the two objects. So, one has this function S i j between any two nodes i and j, this represents how much they are similar to each other. So, you can think of friendship as also being somewhat a notion of similarity between two people for a very complicated meaning of similarity. And uh, again, one can consider analytics on these graphs. So these graphs are also interesting in geometric context. So, you have a uh, huge number of data points and similarity perhaps is related to the distance, the geometric distance between the points. Okay. Good. So, the basic problem we will consider on graphs today is the problem of two way partitioning. I am not sure if this is visible, but basically what we are trying to do is we have a collection of nodes and we have edges between these nodes. We want to partition the two, uh, partition the node into two collections of nodes, into two subsets in such a way that there are very few edges between the subsets. Okay. So, we do more besides we want that we will have weak connectivity between the two uh, sides, 
but each side of the cut should be relatively large. So, for example, it, I mean if we do not require this, it could be that one side of the cut is the whole graph and the other side is nothing, right? in which case there would be no connectivity trivially, but then one side of the graph would be nothing. So, we would want that both sides of the cut are relatively large and still they do not have uh, too many edges between each other. Okay. So, this is this basic problem of two way partitioning and um, uh, more generally one can consider k way partitioning. Okay. So, one would like to con, uh, partition the set of nodes into k subsets in such a way that there is weak connectivity between each of the partitions and then each component of the partition is not too large. And the final notion that we will consider is clustering. So, here we have the previous two notions. So, k way clustering is we want to partition into k subsets of nodes. So, that again we have weak connectivity and that no set no cluster is too large, but on the all, but also we want that there is strong connectivity inside each component of the partition. Okay. So, in a formal sense this was first explicitly written down in a paper by Ravi Kannan, Santosh Rempal and Adrian Veta. Um, and so, this, so clustering in this sense is a stronger notion than just partition. Good. So, let me say a bit more about what I mean by um, weak connectivity. So, this notion of connectivity is captured by uh, the by this parameter called the conductance of a graph. In particular, we have the conductance of this cut. So, this graph cut into these two pieces A and B. So, the conductance is defined like this. So, it is the number of crossing edges between A and B divided by the minimum uh, uh, divided by the minimum of the volume of A and the volume of B. So, and the volume is just defined as the sum of the degrees of nodes in S. Okay. So, if uh, each node has the same degree this is proportional to the size of this subset. So, then uh, if all the nodes have the same degree then this is proportional to the size of the smaller subset. Uh, so, this, this is a very natural notion of uh, connectivity right. We want to make sure that the number of edges is not too large uh, relative to the size of the uh, relative to the size of each of the size of each of the sets. And then we also wanted that the each cluster itself is strongly connected. So, this is captured by this notion called internal conductance. So, the internal conductance of a subset is defined to be the minimum over all subsets S of the conductance between S and A minus S. Okay. So, uh, if we say that the internal conductance of a set A is large that would mean that for any subset that you consider there is a large number of edges between S and the rest of A. So, the problem then uh, again is uh, quite simple. So, we want to so given a graph we want to uh, so for the two way partitioning problem given a graph we want to find a cut into uh, A and B. So, that A and B partition the graph such that the conductance of this cut is as small as possible. Now, the thing is that if there is an efficient algorithm for finding optimal two way partitions on very large graphs then very strange things could happen like I would become the Pope <laughs> which is an NP hard problem. So, basically you would you can use uh, you can use algorithms for finding optimal two way partitions to solve unexpectedly hard problems. But on the other hand I do not really want to be Pope. So, I mean it you could I mean practically optimal is too good to hope for. So, what if we ask for approximately optimal two way partitions. Okay. So, con, uh, so, we want a cut whose conductance is close to the optimally smallest value. Uh, then is it possible that we can get efficient algorithms. So, th this is the problem that we will be uh, considering today. Um, oh, when you are stuck on research one thing that you can do is you can start walking and it is a very good idea in many cases. So, here let us start working on this graph. Um, so, suppose we do a random walk starting from a vertex with uh, 12 steps. Okay. So, if you do this exercise of uh, taking a random walk you see that what happens is that if your right. So, 
yeah, so most of the work stays inside one of these clusters, right? And then occasionally it jumps across the cluster. Um, more formally, we can say this. So, if a component, uh, so we need the component is non bipartite, if it has high internal conductance, means that it is very well connected inside, right? then random work mixes the component well. Uh, what mixes mean is that after some time, you do not have any knowledge of where you started from. And conversely, if there is a cut with small conductance, then the random work takes a longer, much longer time to mix well. So, this is some information about the graph that we can get by doing a random work. And you would like to use this somehow to recover uh, uh, this sparse cut, right. So, but, but it is not clear just by these ob observations how to find this cut. And this is where the magic of the spectral approach comes in. So, the spectral approach can essentially be characterized as follows. So, instead of thinking of you acting on the data, you taking a walk on the graph, you think of the graph itself as acting on something. So, in particular we have uh, I mean we have these uh, two different ways of looking at the situation. So, on the one hand we have this random walker who acts on the graph G. The spectral approach thinks about it in a takes a different uh, approach, it takes a different tack. So, here you view the graph itself as an operator and it acts on certain other objects. In this case it acts on vectors whose which lie inside the unit ball. And the spectral approach gives a very nice connection between these two situations. So, let me describe what this is and how it is connected to the random one. Okay. So, the gra graph will, will now view the graph itself as an operator. Instead of us operating on the graph, the graph itself will be viewed as an operator. And the way it is viewed is as follows. So, you suppose in the rest of the talk, I will assume that the graph is d regular, meaning that each vertex has the same number of edges incident to it. Okay. This uh, condition can be done away readily, but uh, it will make some notation simpler here. So, the so this graph G will now act on vectors whose norm is 1 and it acts in the following way. This operator is called the Laplacian operator. It takes uh, I mean it is 1 over D times the sum of x i minus x j whole square where i and j are is an edge in the graph. Okay. So, for all edges in the graph you look at the difference between x i and x j and you square it. So, one thing is clear that it is non negative. You can also check it is contracting in the sense that the value of this number. So, this is a number right. So, this value of this number is going to be at most the norm of the vector that you start with. Okay. It somehow measures smoothness of input across edges. So, as we will see in the next slide. So, suppose all the x 1 through x n are equal right. So, in this case this quantity which is measuring the discrepancy across edges this is going to be 0. So, this quantity is minimized when the uh, when the uh, this vector is smooth across the edges right? and finally, this Laplacian operator arises in a whole bunch of different places. For example, when you are modeling spring and resistor networks there is a very beautiful way of looking at graphs through the lens of uh, an electrical engineer through the lens of circuit theory, but we will not go into that here, okay. but it is also very connected to the spectral approach. All right. So, as we said one thing is that all the x i's are the same. So, all of them are 1 by root n because we have this condition that the uh, that the uh, square of the sum of the squares of the x i's has to be 1. Um, in that case this operator produces 0. And we will call this the first eigenvector. As we said, 0 is the minimum that this that the value of this operator can take because this is a non negative operator. Uh, and we will call the first eigenvector any vector which actually achieves 0. Okay. And we see that for any graph, if you take all the xi's to be the same, it will always achieve 0. Okay. Uh, it is true that there is not necessarily always a, a unique first eigenvector. So, for example, consider the situation in which you have in which the graph consists of two disconnected components. Okay. So, and suppose you have this vector which is uniform on this component and 0 on this component. In this case also 
the uh, this operator, the Laplacian operator produces zero because it just looks at the discrepancy across edges, right? Not across, uh, not across pairs of vertices across this cut. So this is also a candidate for a first second vector. But for the rest of the talk, let's just fix some first second vector x, which achieves this uh, value zero. Cool. Now we define the second eigen vector. So the second eigen vector is a vector y that minimizes the value of this operator uh, g of y while being orthogonal to the first eigen vector. So orthogonal means that it's the inner product between y and x is zero. Okay, it's, it's the angle is 90 degrees between x and y. And the value of g of y is called the Fiedler value in honor of uh, Miroslav Fiedler, who first sort of introduced this notion uh, in the context of partitioning. And um, and uh, this we'll refer to this by the parameter lambda. Okay. Good. So what does the second eigenvector capture? So it's so it minimizes g of y while being orthogonal. So, notice that g of y could still be 0. Okay. Um, good. So, uh, another point is that both y and lambda can be approximated efficiently. Sorry, I could not see how much time is there? 20 minutes. Good. Uh, so, both y and lambda can be approximated efficiently. I say approximated because a priori lambda could be a uh, uh, I mean, could be a could not could be an irrational number. So you may not be able to get the exact value, but it can be approximated efficiently because uh, I mean by known methods in linear algebra. Okay. Now, now let's see. So, uh, so the second eigenvector capture has this property that it's orthogonal to the first eigenvector and minimizes this. So now use this. So the basis of the spectral partitioning algorithm is an embedding of the graph on a line using this second eigenvector. So you take y, and suppose we reorder the vertices so that y1 through yn are in uh, non-decreasing order, and embed them on a line. So uh, this is y1, this is 1, 2, 3, 4. So this is placed in position y1. So this is placed in position y2. This is placed in position y3, and so on. Okay. Now the intuition is that spectral embedding minimizes the number of long edges, right? Because if you have a long edge, it contributes a lot to this sum because y i minus y j is then going to be large, but this quantity is small. So, you only have very short edges and in fact, this uh, spectral, embe spectral embedding like in this way was used, uh, I was proposed as a way to actually draw graphs. I mean, so you, uh, Atkins, Bowman, Hendrickson used this spectral embedding to propose a way to draw graphs when embedded on a line. You just draw them according uh, to the second eigenvector. So anyway, in our context, the intuition is that the spectral embedding minimizes the number of long edges. And now the spectral partitioning algorithm is simple to describe. You just sweep over the spectral embedding and find the cut of lowest conductance. Okay. So for every so the algorithm is just this. You just sweep over this thing, uh, you sweep over the n vertices in the order that was provided to you by the second eigenvector. And for each cut, so here, 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 and here, and here, you check the value of the conductance. So this is a very easily computable quantity. And you just find the cut of lowest conductance. And the intuition again is basically just that uh, then this order make sure that there are not too many long edges. Right? So, I mean, uh, so if there was a sparse cut, intuitively there should be a sparse cut also in this order. And there is a formal theorem to this effect. Uh, this was proven in the 1980s by a bunch of people in different contexts. So, if G has a cut of conductance phi, then the spectral partitioning algorithm finds a cut of conductance at most 2 root phi. So, phi here is a quantity which is less than 1. So, this is this could be larger if phi is small, uh, but in any case this is a formal guarantee. Okay. Uh, what Mihail proved is that you do not really need a second eigenvector. You can find something which is approximately approximately a second eigenvector, uh, I mean meaning that the lambda quantity is close is small and uh, this still works. So, theoretically better algorithms are known in terms of approximating conductance, 
But still, the spectral partitioning method is very much of interest till today because it's easy to implement and it admits good heuristics. And as we'll see, we can extend this into clustering algorithms. Good. Any questions at this point? Yes. So, the definition of conductance takes the minimum of, uh, so the denominator in the definition of conductance is the minimum of the volume of A and volume of B. So, if one side is too large, one of the sides will be too small and then the conductance will blow up. So, I mean uh, another way of saying it is that you want both of them to be, uh, I mean you want, uh, you are dividing by the one which has volume at most half of the total volume. Okay. Uh, right. So, let us just see this algorithm on a specific graph. So, this is the graph that we already saw. This is, um, I mean, the trivial case when you have two disconnected components. So, let us take the first second vector to be this vector, which is uniform on the first component and uh, 0 on the second component. This we said produces the value 0 by this operator. So, the second eigen vector, we can take the vector which is 0 on this component and uniform on this component. And again, this also produces 0, right? Because again, you are just taking the discrepancy along edges. But we, but this is orthogonal to the first second vector because if you take the inner product, you see that the inner product is 0 because they are on disjointly supported subsets. Good. Sorry. Uh, wait. And <laughs> what happened to the rest of it? <laughs> uh, okay, I'll just quickly get my one. Okay, so we are here, right? Um, yeah, so if you just do the embedding that I said, you, so the embedding was just you put all these values according to the value of that is uh, given by the second eigenvector. So these all, these values all map to 0 and these values all map to the same point and so the cut is precisely the cut that we want. Uh, and in fact, this Fiedler value lambda, so here lambda is 0, right? So, this is 0 uh, if and only if the graph is disconnected. So, let us look at this k way partitioning problem. So, the k way partitioning problem again is we are trying to uh, construct k subsets in which the uh, conductance between each of the parts is small. Okay. This can be defined appropriately. And here is a very natural algorithm, it is recursive two way partitioning. So, you first use spectral partitioning to produce a partition into G 1 and G 2 okay. and then you compute the, the second eigenvalue, the Fiedler value of G 1 and Fiedler value of G 2 and whichever is smaller you recurse on that component. So, each time you produce one more cut and you stop when k minus 1 cuts have been formed. So, there are some details in this algorithm, but uh, let me just keep it at this level. Now, this produces a provably good k way partition and uh, good bounds were shown recently by Louis Raghavendra, Tetali and Vempala. But in some sense, this recursive uh, two uh, recursive bipartitioning is not very interesting on some practical instances as the output may not be a clustering. Right? So, in a clustering as we said we wanted additionally that each of the components itself be strongly connected. So, their, their internal conductance has to be large. So, how do we make sure of that? 
one way of uh, going about it is looking at higher order eigenvalue. So, so far we have only looked at the second eigenvalue, but we can similarly just as we define the second eigenvalue, we can define higher order eigenvalues. So, let us again take x 1 to be the first eigenvector and you define x i to be a vector that minimizes the Laplacian operator conditioned on it being orthogonal to the previous i minus 1 vectors and you define lambda i to be the operator when acting on x i. Uh, so, for example, we can uh, let us look at this graph which just consists of 5 disconnected components. Okay. So, x 1 can be the uh, vector which is uniform on the first component and 0 on the rest. x 2 is the one which is uniform uh, on, uh, on the second component and 0 on the rest and so on. Each x i is uniform on the ith component and 0 on the rest. So, they are all orthogonal to each other because they are disjointly supported. Uh, right. And moreover, if you look at this graph, you see that I mean if you are just given the these eigenvectors right, and you did not have the partitioning, you could still recover it because if you look at each of the so, so the so each column here corresponds to a vector. So, think about each column corresponding to a vector. So, the so the first set of vertices only have once in the only have once in the first index. Okay. The second set of vertices only have once in the second coordinate. The third set of vertices only have once in the third coordinate and so on. So, you can think of each of the vertices being given a 5 dimensional vector which just consists of the values of the Eigen vector on the 5 eigenvectors on that vertex. Right. So, this naturally defines an embedding uh, of the n vertices into r k exactly in the way that I said. So, you take each vertex v and you map it to x 1 of v, x 2 of v through x k of v. In the case of uh, spectral partitioning, the two way partitioning algorithm, we had basically k equal to 2 and we are looking at x 1 of v and x 2 of v, but x 1 of v essentially is known because x 1 is all you can always take x 1 to be the uniform vector. Okay. So, you just send a one dimensional mapping. So, here also essentially you have a k minus one dimensional mapping, but we can represent it as a embedding into r k. And um, the spectral clustering algorithm essentially if we ignore some details looks like this. So, you construct the spectral embedding. So, you embed into r to the k and then you cluster the vectors in r k using known clustering algorithms that work over r k okay, like k means and k center. Okay. So, these are very well known clustering algorithms which are geometric clustering algorithms, but we are actually working over some arbitrary collection of objects some arbitrary graph right. They are not necessarily they do not really have any geometric meaning, but still we are now applying these geometric algorithms after doing this embedding. So, this um, type of algorithm I mean two variants were analyzed by Xi and Malik and then Ng, Jordan and Weiss. Okay. So, these are two very influential papers in the machine learning community. So, performance wise uh, the empirical results of these clustering algorithms are very appealing and the algorithm does not make any assumption on the form of clusters and theoretical results are starting to catch up. So, there was a paper last year by Sharan Oves, Karan and Luca Trevisan and then just a couple of weeks ago there was another paper by De Rossi and Siduropoulos who analyzed basically uh, the uh, this algorithm where instead of where they use the k center an approximation of the k center algorithm. So, challenges ahead well we need to still get a better understanding of spectral clustering because uh, the uh, I mean the theoretical results are still a bit lacking and it is not there may be other uh, other ways to go about the specifics. Uh, we also do not have a good spectral theory for directed graphs. So, spectral theory for directed graphs is very useful for example, page rank is doing analysis on the internet graph where you have on the link graph right. You have an edge when one web page refers to another web page. So, this is clearly a directed graph and uh, page rank is essentially looking at the stationary distribution of this graph. So, one perhaps there exists a spectral theory for directed graphs also which is useful, but this is a bit hard technically because 
I mean, the graphs are, are not symmetric, so you don't have real eigenvalues. And finally, an interesting challenge is how to combine these spectral methods with other information about the data set. Okay. So, the spectral algorithm by itself, the spectral algorithms by uh, themselves work on very general objects, right, uh, by uh, on just graphs. But perhaps you can take into account some other information about these objects. For example, the graph itself could be a similarity graph, where the edges are defined according to some similarity relation. And perhaps the particular notion of similarity used can be can be uh, useful in designing the algorithm. All right, I think I'll end here. So, any questions, comments? Yes, please. So, before you ask a question, can you please introduce yourself, your name, and where you're from? Because there are also others. We all know you, <laughs> or brothers. I have just a simple question. This whole thing depended on the action of G. Right. That was specifically chosen as the Laplacian. Right. What happens if we change it? Is what was the reason for choosing that, and right. are there other choices for the action? Right. Yeah. Um, so the so I didn't get too much into the details of why the Laplacian is defined in this way. But basically, if you look at the action of the random walker on the graph, okay, so the how if you look at the Markov chain that's defined by the by the random walk, that essentially uh, I mean that, that that can be described by a by a linear operator, right? And the second uh, and the second eigenvalue of that linear operator corresponds to minimizing the Laplacian. So it's very tightly related to the way I mean looking at graphs through the random walk approach. Yes. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, sir, I wanted to understand. See, if you look at this, if you go through theoretical backgrounds and all, it looks very nice. They're using Laplace, cake center, came in clustering, and all those things in here. Right. I want to understand: Have you thought of any real application where it can fit into a real problem, which we can solve by using this spectral theory and spectral partitioning graph theory? Yeah. Uh, first of all, there may be better people to talk to regarding actual applications because I work more on the theory side. But let me make a few comments. So there are uh, known applications of uh, the spectral clustering algorithm, as I described. For example, in image segmentation. So, if you have an image, so this initial paper by uh, Shi and Malik, I think, uh, applied this for image segmentation. Um, and uh, and the other point is that this clustering algorithm can work in much more complicated settings. So, for example, if you're so the k-means or k-center work when the clusters themselves for, form convex sets, but uh, this algorithm can work even if you have say intertwined spirals and things like that, it can still distinguish between uh, these different clusters. Sure, that sounds like an interesting application. But, uh, we can talk more offline in detail. So, may I know your name and where you're from? Uh, I work in Australian Media Manager. Okay. And I work in the area of data analytics. I see. And I work at all applied data analytics, and particularly the machine, machine learning. But I'm trying to use all the machine learning in the area of manufacturing and supply chain. So, there I come across this problem. One of the problems of our They want to understand how this social network analysis can be fit into the banking domain. Because for them, it is something which is very interesting. And right. they're very interested in knowing how to squeeze the social network concept of eigenvector analysis, connectivity, and all those things to find out the fraud transaction. Right, right. Thank you. And I think you guys are very good researcher in this domain. Come up with some kind of 
Uh, sure. sure. We can right. talk more. We'll talk more. All right. Yeah. So, yeah, the question from that side? Yeah. So, uh, I just want to know what happens if the graph is disconnected such that only few nodes are disconnected from the other part of the graph. So, the main motivation of doing a, uh, like a clustering was uh, to have uh, like uh, almost equal partition, right? If I, uh, so, right. but uh, the clustering algorithm as you suggested, like the Fiedler value will be zero for a disconnected graph. But uh, if the graph is disconnected such that only one or two nodes are disconnected from the other part of the graph, then how does the algorithm take care of that thing? Right. So in this case, uh, the definition of conductance, if the, if the number of edges is zero, then it does not matter wh what the size of one of the sets is. So as you said, if, uh, it, if you have k many uh, disconnected, uh, I mean k many isolated vertices, then your first k eigenvalues will be 0. But uh, if you have only a small number of edges, then I mean say if you have one edge, then uh, the conductance would still be large because you are now dividing by the, you are dividing a positive quantity by the size of one of the sides. So, so 0 is somehow a special case for this definition of conductance where I mean the conductance value becomes 0. But if you have small number of edges, then this, value, then this definition of conductance still makes sense where uh, uh, I mean you are looking at uh, when you are dividing by the size of the smaller side. Um, but sir, uh, we can take the normalized value for example, if there are large edges in a graph. So, uh, at least one or two edges we can just normalize it and then it would be a very small factor. And even if we divide it by a lot, so let us say there are a large right. number of edges compared to… In the interest of time, um, maybe offline and please introduce yourself. Shweta, I am currently doing my PhD and uh, I am in my third year. Okay. It sounds like uh, we can talk offline. Right. Uh, time for a couple of more questions. Yes. So, so this question has been studied and then uh, but this I mean the approach that I described uh, uses the value of k. Um, I mean one thing that you can do is you can just look at different values of k and see which provides the best clustering. But there are other algorithms for uh, I mean uh, unsupervised algorithms which somehow detect the number of clusters and go from there. But I am not aware of any formal results on that front. Time for one last question. Okay, there. Yeah, there, there. The mic is not on, I think. Yes, can you hear me? Okay. So in the real big data regime, when you have, say, millions of nodes, when it's even tough to store the matrix itself, so does it even make sense to do find the eigenvectors and do such computations? Yeah, it's also a great question. Uh, so here we actually need access to the whole graph, right, in order to compute these eigenvectors. There are other graph partitioning algorithms known as local graph partitioning algorithms, whose running time is essentially uh, proportional to the size of the cluster that you find and not the, not the entire graph. Um, so th that is a whole different class of algorithms. So they can they also have, uh, they can also be analyzed using spectral methods, but I did not uh, talk about them here. I mean, you can search on for local graph partitioning algorithms and you will find references. Okay, so many thanks. Uh, of course, Orna will be around after the talk. We can have uh, further questions can be taken up after that. But may I request Professor Anurag Kumar to give a small token of thanks to our speaker today.
So may I invite the next speaker, Professor Rajesh Sundareshan. Welcome everyone on this holiday. Um, I'm going to speak about belief propagation uh, for a large scale network optimization. <laughs> now, uh, uh, recently I met Arnab at uh, Prakriti and we were wondering uh, in delivering the stocks, these stocks, at what level we should pitch these stocks. So we were really thinking like bowlers, Ishan Sharma and Mohammed Shami, but Professor Narahari wants us to bat like Kohli and uh, Pujara. We will try to do our best. So let me begin with this famous uh, data set, uh, the Netflix uh, data set. So this is a data set uh, of about 20,000 movies, which have been rated by about 500,000 uh, users. So there were a total of about 100 million entries, 100 million ratings. And uh, Netflix put this out for users to, uh, many, as many of you know, uh, for users to essentially uh, come up with algorithms for uh, collaborative filtering in the sense that um, you, uh, algorithm designers have to essentially predict ratings on uh, about 1.4 million queries that were, um, that were uh, not, uh, the locations were specified. Netflix had information about the ratings but uh, users could essentially come up with predictions and uh, uh, test how their algorithm was doing. Netflix itself had some algorithm which had a certain performance and uh, uh, it had announced a grand prize of about a million dollars if users could do, uh, if algorithm designers could come up with uh, collaborating filter <coughs> collaborative filtering algorithms which were significantly better than Netflix, Netflix's own algorithm. Okay. So, uh, Let's call this uh, matrix of ratings M. It's an incomplete matrix. It's a huge matrix, as you can see. Um, one approach, and a very popular approach, to do this uh, um, kind of collaborative filtering is to approximate this matrix M in terms of uh, a low-rank matrix, a low-rank matrix of uh, rank, say, R. And this is represented as A times B transpose. Both A and B are of rank R. And uh, the goal uh, for in this approach is essentially to come up with this A and B such that you minimize uh, this error on the revealed entries, I and J. Plus, there is uh, some regularization term so that uh, the algorithm encourages the use of A's with small values and B's with small values as well. And uh, uh, the grand prize was essentially announced in 2009. There was uh, uh, a team of uh, two groups essentially merged together uh, to win this uh, million dollar prize and then Netflix announced the results and concluded the competition in about 2009. About a year after that there was a much better algorithm, uh, better than the winning algorithm which is based on belief propagation and so that's the motivation for this particular talk. So what I will do is uh, not focus on the problems per se but uh, on this particular tool belief propagation I'll give an overview of this algorithm and perhaps uh, you can apply it uh, if you have learned something about this in other settings. So what is uh, belief propagation? Well, it's an iterative and uh, local algorithm for computing the marginal probabilities of a graphical probability model. So I'll explain these terms uh, in the next slides. Uh, but uh, what I will say here is that I'll hasten to add um, that uh, this is primarily going to be uh, 
a tool talk, but then we will see something about the optimization uh, of the variety that we saw in the previous slide come up a little later in the talk. So what's a local algorithm? A local algorithm is one which essentially uh, is uh, um, a prescription for an operation at each of these nodes. And this prescription essentially is based on computations that are made based on information from just the nearest neighbors. So such an algorithm is a local algorithm. And uh, this belief propagation algorithm is essentially such a prescription. And it's done iteratively, repeatedly. And each of these nodes essentially do these operations as per a prescription uh, in a repeated fashion. And this iterative and local uh, property ensures that it's amenable to a distributed implementation. Okay, so let's go on to see what the other terms are here. And uh, I'll do this, I'll introduce belief propagation via a simple communication example. So let's say that there is a message that has been sent over the air, and this message can be zero or one with equal probability. And there are three receivers, uh, uh, famous characters, Amar, Akbar, and Anthony, uh, which receive noisy copies of this message. It's a common message, but they receive noisy copies of this. For example, uh, the message that Amar receives, let's call it Y1, it's the message that has been transmitted, but there is a possibility that this message may be flipped. Okay, so it could be the message itself, and that happens. In this case, uh, EI is 0 with probability 0.9, so with 90% chance, he's essentially getting the correct message. But there is a 10% probability that he's getting the flipped message. The same thing happens for Akbar and for Anthony. So let's say, for example, that Amar receives the signal 1, a bit 1. Akbar receives a bit 1. But Anthony receives 0. So he, uh, he perhaps uh, is differing from, uh, his reception is different from what Amar and Akbar have. Now, uh, given these probabilities, Amar, Akbar, and Anthony, based on the receptions that they have gotten, they can go back to their rooms and uh, do some number crunching. And they come back with a belief of what the message is. But this number crunching is just the Bayes uh, rule. And so Amar's belief that the message that was transmitted is one, based on his copy, based on his received uh, information alone, is 0.9. Okay. Akbar's belief is also the same. But Antony uh, wants to differ. His belief that the message is one is 0.1. Now, these are the beliefs based on the information that they have uh, uh, gotten, uh, their based on their receptions alone. But then they can go, they can now collaborate with each other. But there are some restrictions. Amar can only talk to Akbar, but not to Antony. And similarly, Antony can only talk to Akbar, not to, not to Amar. So these are the restrictions that they have for uh, exchanging their messages. The question is, what is Amar's posterior belief that the message is one. Okay. So in this case, it turns out that the message is the same. Uh, there's, there's one common message. And so eventually, whatever is Amar's posterior is also going to be Akbar's posterior, is also going to be Antony's posterior. But our goal now is to find Amar's uh, posterior here. So one can describe uh, uh, this setup in the form of a graph. And that's where a graphical model comes. So here is a graphical model. Um, when one uh, uh, employs Bayes' rule to, find, uh, to write down the probability of the message. So let's actually introduce uh, uh, a variable x1 for the message that has been transmitted. And we'll think of it as the message that was sent to Amar. We'll introduce two auxiliary variables, which is x2 and x3. Okay. We think of these as messages transmitted to Akbar and uh, to Antony. But then, uh, so these will be our variable nodes. They can be 0 or 1. And so we represent them in, a, in the form of uh, nodes of a graph like this. It turns out that when you employ Bayes' rule, you can essentially write out the posterior probability of the message given the observations in this form, in this product form, where the first three terms are essentially the initial beliefs by, applying, by uh, each of them applying Bayes' rule. But we do know that x1 and x2 must be the same. It's the same message that has been transmitted. And x2 and x3 must be the same. And one way to impose the condition that x1, x2, and x3 are the same is to essentially impose these additional product terms, which ensures that the posterior 
lives only on uh, the set of x1, x2, x3 that agree with each other. Okay, because it's the same message that has been transmitted. And so we impose a condition that x1 must be equal to x2. And similarly, x2 must be equal to x3. Now, you will notice that this probability distribution has now been written in the form of this factor. And what one does is, for each of these factors, one introduces a new type of node in the graph. And let's use the square or the, uh, um, or the uh, rectangle here to represent these, uh, uh, these factors. So this factor, for example, represents the initial belief of Amar, given his observation. This one for Akbar and this one for Antony. Additionally, there are these two other checks, which is that the message must be the same. So that's here. And another uh, factor for x2 and x3 must be the same. So there are a total of five factors here and five such squares here. And then what one does, uh, once one has put down all these uh, nodes, is one throws in the edges. And the edges represent what are all the variable nodes that are participating in a particular factor. For example, if I look at this factor that corresponds to this uh, uh, factor node, x1 and x2 participate there, and the check is that x1 is equal to x2. So one throws in these two edges there. And similarly for b. As far as these are concerned, uh, they stand on their own. They are connected only to x1 or x2 or x3, and you see only those edges there. So this kind of a graph, which essentially represents this uh, product distribution, is called the factor graph representation. And any such probability distribution, which in some sense, uh, for those who are familiar uh, with Markov processes. This is essentially Markovity on, on a graph. Okay, so it's uh, essentially indicating dependent structure on a graph. This is the factor graph representation of this uh, graphical model. The goal, as I said in the previous slide, is to compute the marginal probability. What's the probability that the message was one, or Amar's posterior that the message was one, given uh, all the messages? This example turns out to be a very simple example, so you can actually go and do the computation. The answer is 0.9. So it's, uh, it's uh, fairly easy to do this. But let's see how one would do it using belief propagation. The way one does using belief propagation is uh, one uh, uh, sets up a, uh, a prescription for transmission of messages, for operations on messages that come in, and transmission, uh, computation of some functions and transmission of those, uh, of those messages of those computed functions. So let's uh, start off with some initial messages. Perhaps the initial messages are uh, each of these nodes. Uh, for example, in the case of uh, uh, the initial beliefs, uh, in, in this example, uh, this, message, this node would send the initial belief to the variable node. Similarly, this node would send its initial belief. This node would send its initial belief. So we can set up some initial conditions. A variable node, what it does is it takes in these messages coming from uh, all the other uh, uh, factor nodes, and then it sends messages back to these factor nodes. And the way these messages are computed is as follows. Uh, let's focus on one particular communication, the one that goes from node i to the factor a. So this message is, comp uh, is uh, identified as follows. You take in the messages that come from each of these other factor nodes, okay, discounting A. And then you do some operation on it. And this operation results in a certain belief of what this particular, uh, of in a belief that this particular value is equal to 1. And what this node does is it sends that belief to A. Uh, this node will send similar messages to the others. And when it computes a message for this node, it's going to take all the other, other incoming messages. So this happens at each of these variable nodes. So it's very local. It's based on only the messages that come in. In the next phase, uh, it's the turn of these factor nodes to send messages. So what these factor nodes do is uh, these factor nodes, take in, uh, they are essentially indications of some sort of a constraint. So they take in the beliefs that each of these variables are sending. And let's, for example, focus on the message that A will send to I. It's going to take in the message that this uh, uh, variable node sends to A, that this variable node sends to A. In particular, all the other variable nodes send, will send their beliefs of their particular values. 
So this factor node takes all of those things into account, does some computation, and says, node i, I think my belief is that you ought to be one with this probability. So this factor node is going to send that message. So he, here is a simple example. For example, let us say that this factor node is something that says that x1 plus xi plus these two in uh, modulo 2 uh, must essentially be 0. That's essentially an even parity check. That means there must be, uh, the probability is essentially supported on x1, let's call this x2 and x3. Uh, x1, x2, x3 must have an even number of ones. If this node says that it's a 1, if it has a belief that it's a 1, and this node says that it has a belief that it's 1, okay, that is the probability that it's 1 is close to 1. And what this uh, factor node will inform this node is, I see two of them already close to one. I can have only an even number of ones, so you ought to be zero. So that's the kind of uh, messages that get passed across these uh, nodes. So this is a variable node. It essentially passes beliefs about its own value, whereas this factor nodes are essentially constraint nodes. They take into account the beliefs of all the other nodes and pass on the constraints. So I hope that is uh, clear. At the end, uh, so this happens. Uh, it's, a, it's a local algorithm. You do this repeatedly. So it's an iterative algorithm. Hopefully, things have converged. And what one does to compute the posterior is essentially take all these converged messages and do something, some other operation, and that puts out the posteriors. So that's uh, what uh, belief propagation is. That's what this message, this particular message passing algorithm is all about. It's called the sum product algorithm. I haven't given the specifics of the exact uh, function operations here, but uh, the idea, I hope, is uh, clear. There are three natural questions that one should ask here. Does this algorithm converge? So in order to be able to compute the posterior, you must have some converged values here. So does this algorithm converge? Does it produce the correct answer? Does it really give you the marginal? That's another question. And if it does converge, how many iterations does it take? So these are uh, three natural questions that one can ask. And it turns out that one can actually answer in the affirmative when the graph is a tree. So belief propagation works on trees. So on a tree of diameter d, this algorithm that I uh, abstractly described is something that converges after d steps to yield the correct marginals. Okay. So in our example, uh, in the Amar Akbar Antony example, the belief that Amar has is 0.9, that uh, the message is 1. The belief that Akbar has is 0.9. The belief that uh, Antony has is 0.1. Uh, here are the converged messages, and they are actually um, uh, amenable to some interpretation. So let's look at the message that goes from this node to here. That message is something that takes into account, uh, or it's passing the information to this variable node that it has seen messages from two other nodes. One of them is a 1, and the other one is a 0. So there is a 50-50 chance that the others are telling that the message is 1 or a 0. So that's what this message is telling. On the other hand, the message that comes here is a reflection of the fact that two of these have seen a 1. So there is a significant amount of confidence. It's nearly 0.99 that, this, uh, that you ought to take the value 1 and not 0. And that's contrary to his initial observation. On the other hand, the messages that go here is, uh, well, this message is passing whatever message it got from there. That's a 90% uh, belief that uh, the message is 1. And this message is, this node is just passing whatever it got from here. That's point one. So that's the converged uh, set of values. This is, of course, a tree. And of course, it will converge in uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 6 steps. So one can execute this algorithm, and 6 steps, you'll get this answer. And uh, uh, one does an operation to find out eventually what the posterior is. So this works. It's a very simple example. You can hand compute everything. But then it's amenable to a distributed implementation. It has been done in large data sets. But uh, we know that belief propagation works on trees. There can be several loops. Here is an example of loops. And does it work in a setting where there are loops? It turns out that it need not necessarily work. And uh, this is an example where I've thrown in an extra check node uh, to the previous example. And this extra check node says that 
x1 and x3 must disagree, while x1 and x2 must agree, and x2 and x3 must agree. So straight away, it's clear that you can't have any global probability distribution that uh, satisfies these constraints. Because this one says x1 is equal to x2. This one says x2 is equal to x3. That therefore, x1 must be equal to x3. But this check note says that they must differ. Yet, you can come up with uh, a particular initiation of initialization of these messages. And in particular, a belief of 0.5, for example, is uh, something that's locally consistent. So uh, these nodes will essentially pass messages. And they will all be happily converged at this 0 0.5, 0 0.5 value. So what belief propagation, therefore, is doing is it's ensuring local consistency. Each of these nodes is essentially looking at constraints locally. And it's ensuring local consistency. But perhaps that may need not be global consistency. So here are some applications. Uh, even with loop, I mean, there are many applications where uh, uh, trees appear often enough. So you can apply this in several of those settings. You can compute marginals of many, many variables, and the algorithm will be correct on trees. You can sample from this distribution. And we'll see an example a little later. Um, you can compute maximum likelihood estimates. And that's like dynamic programming on trees, so this is something that many of you may have seen. And uh, this particular maximum likelihood estimate uh, can be done in a somewhat simplified fashion using a marginally different algorithm. It's called the max product algorithm. Because all you need is uh, which one carries the maximum. So it's really like dynamic programming. And of course, this uh, originated in statistical physics. You can compute uh, where uh, the computation of the normalization constant is an important, uh, uh, is an important step. And uh, one can use belief propagation to compute uh, uh, this normalization constant. It has also been used in optimization, and I'll speak about that. So uh, for the rest of the talk, I'm going to focus on optimization, um, and in particular, how belief propagation can be used for this setup. And in doing that, I want to essentially highlight two issues with belief propagation, one of which we have already seen. We have seen the problem of loops. We have seen the problem of loops. And we'll see if that problem arises in this context here as well. We'll see how to get over it. And we'll also uh, encounter a new phenomenon. So I want to uh, uh, highlight those new phenomena through this example. So belief propagation for optimization. And instead of focusing on the, uh, uh, on the initial example that I gave, I'll look at a somewhat more classical but equally uh, uh, famous uh, uh, problem of optimal assignment. Okay, so here is the problem. So there are n jobs. And these are represented by the nodes on the left-hand side. And n machines that can service these jobs. Any job can go to any of these machines. You know, job J can go to any of these machines. And this is true for every job. Okay. When job J is assigned to a particular machine, let's say M, the cost of running that job on machine M is, let's say, CJM. There are some constraints. The constraints are that every job must be assigned. That's uh, one constraint. The other constraint is that each machine can have at most one. And since every job must be assigned, there are equal number of jobs and machines. Each machine must have exactly one job. Okay, so those are the constraints that we have. The goal is to assign each job to a machine uh, so that the total cost is minimized. Okay, the total cost is essentially, uh, if job J is assigned to machine M, the cost is CJM. You sum up all such costs based on the assignment. And you have to minimize this. Okay. This uh, problem is something that's uh, uh, familiar to all computer scientists. Uh, it's what is called the minimum weight complete matching problem. And uh, the number of possibilities is, well, really, uh, every permutation is possible. So there are a total of n factorial. Okay, so the first job can go to any of the n machines, the second one to any of the n minus 1 that are left behind, the third one to any of the n minus 2, and so on. So that's really n factorial possibilities. But computer scientists are very clever. They know how to. Uh, uh, get around these n factorial possibilities and come up with some sort of uh, pruning so that they have to, uh, they, they can find the optimum in this particular instance. They can find the optimum in just order of n cube steps. That's all they need. What we want to do is try belief propagation uh, because uh, it's a distributed algorithm. So you can essentially uh, give the responsibility of various operations to these individual nodes. And uh, perhaps they are on different uh, servers and you'll be able to get the computation done rather easily. 
So the take that we will have on this particular problem is one of, uh, uh, well, I want to use belief propagation, uh, but I said belief propagation is an algorithm for computing the marginal probabilities on a graphical probability model. So where's the graphical probability model? What are the random variables here? Okay, so for that, we will take this relaxed assignment viewpoint and we'll come up with a factor graph. The relaxed assignment viewpoint essentially uh, assigns, uh, comes up with these following variables. So for each of these edges, which is a possibility that job J can be assigned to machine M, you essentially have a variable which you set to one if that has been the assignment and you set to zero otherwise. If job J has been sent to some other machine, this particular AJM will be zero. So it's a binary flag saying whether, uh, and there are a total of N square of them, and each flag says whether that particular job which it represents has been connected to that particular machine which it represents. So AJM is either zero or one. So those are going to be our uh, random variables. And what we will do is we'll come up with a product form via some relaxations. In particular, we are going to have two kinds of relaxations. Okay. The first uh, relaxation is one of, it's all right if you do not assign every job. But you must uh, uh, ensure uh, that one job goes only to one machine. You can't uh, send the same job to two machines. So that constraint is essentially uh, enforced here. For example, this says that for machine J, if you look at these variables A, J, M, these are either zero or one, you sum it up, that must be less than or equal to one. It says that it can go at most to one machine. And similarly, here this says that each machine can take at most one job. Okay, so this is one relaxation. We are not demanding that this be equal to one and we are not demanding that this be equal to one. When it's equal to one, it says that that job is assigned, but it's possible that it's zero. Okay, so that's one, uh, that's one relaxation. We'll come to another relaxation, but uh, for each of these variables, we must have a variable node, and here are all these n square edges. We think of these variable nodes. And of course, these are constraints that's are, that are associated with uh, jobs and machines, so here are the constraint nodes that correspond to each of these constraints. Okay, so these are the nodes that we have. And of course, we can now put down all the, uh, all the links because this constraint involves just this job and that, uh, uh, it, 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 this constraint involves um, uh, all these variables that are corresponding to these edges that emanate from job J. And therefore, it's connected to all of these nodes and similarly. Okay, so it's fairly straightforward to get to this. But in addition, I'm going to come up with the next relaxation. And this relaxation has two knobs. Okay, so let's see uh, what uh, these two knobs do. Um, we introduce a new product. And the new product this is motivated once again by statistical physics. Uh, this, uh, this new product is e raised to minus beta times this variable, whether it is one or zero, times the cost minus the correction. Okay, so let's see what this does. Uh, you will see that uh, the beta and the gamma both are positive. Uh, when you take this product and uh, in the exponent they will sum, that essentially gives a sum of AJM. That gives you how many jobs have been assigned in all. And since beta and gamma are positive, what it does is when beta and gamma are large, as you increase this beta and gamma, it has a tendency to put more mass on assignments which essentially cover more jobs. So the more the number of jobs that are assigned, the larger the beta and gamma, the greater the probability for such assignments. Okay, so that's one uh, good thing that we have. So that when we tweak this gamma factor and make it go to infinity, that will concentrate the mass on complete matchings. So that's one good thing that we have. The other knob is this beta uh, parameter, and that comes with a minus sign. And this minus sign is multiplied by uh, minus beta AJM CJM. So when you sum it up, that's exactly the cost of this particular assignment. And so thanks to this negative beta and beta being positive, when you let beta go to infinity, once again it has a tendency to push mass or concentrate mass on all of those settings where the cost is minimum. So these two knobs enable us to control this. Okay. What we'll do is choose a large enough gamma and beta and we'll sample from this distribution using uh, I said that sampling is something that we can do with belief propagation, so we'll just do this. So it would give you an approximate answer. The sample, the realization that you have will be a bunch of zeros and ones. 
it will meet all the constraints as per this. And then perhaps you have to make a small correction to ensure that every job is assigned to some machine or the other. So that's the uh, relaxation that we have. But you will see that there are quite a few loops in this. For example, uh, this node is connected to this node. This is connected to this. This is connected to this. And this is connected to this. All, of course, through uh, variable nodes. But of course, you see this, la uh, this loop. And you will see every loop that you can envisage in a complete bipartite graph, because this is, after all, a complete bipartite graph. So there are no guarantees that this particular algorithm can work a priori. So in order to get a feel for what, uh, how, uh, how these loops, loops will affect the algorithm, uh, we will uh, essentially uh, shift a little, uh, have a further shift in our philosophy. And this is a take uh, that's uh, uh, something that electrical engineers uh, do fairly easily. Uh, because we always look at typical circumstances, average case uh, behavior, and so on. Whereas the computer scientists want to en ensure that the worst case is handled well. Okay. They can toss coins, but that's in their algorithm. So as far as the input is concerned, they have to be ensure that uh, your algorithm uh, will essentially do well, uh, maybe with some probabilistic guarantees, but on every, uh, uh, every input. Here, we will take the viewpoint that the input is random. And so we are, we are essentially uh, doing some sort of uh, a Bayesian relaxation here. And so we'll assign costs. We, we will assign some random variable to the cost. The costs we'll take are independent uh, with a certain distribution. And the distribution we'll take is uniform, 0, 1. That's an example. And the results are actually fairly robust to other distributions as well. So uh, we'll stick to this particular distribution. The beliefs themselves, as a consequence of this uh, randomness, the beliefs themselves are now random variables because they depend on the particular realization. So that's a complication that one has to deal with. But uh, uh, this is something that can be handled. The other shift in philosophy is that instead of looking at uh, fixed n, we'll essentially let n go to infinity. Perhaps a clearer typical limiting picture will emerge. In particular, loops perhaps do not matter. And that's what we are heading towards. Yes. Uh, I won't associate a weight to this, so it is not the uniform probability distribution. In particular, I want those which have lower total weight to have a higher probability. So this is not the uniform distribution. I want the mass to concentrate on the minimum cost complete matching eventually, as beta goes to infinity. So did I answer your question satisfactorily? All right, so let's. Uh, Ask what happens to loops. Now, with this new viewpoint, what happens is that if you look at a typical uh, uh, the, the distribution of these costs, uh, machine J on, uh, job J on machine M is independent and uniform 0, 1. So if you look at a typical job J's perspective, okay, the costs are of the order of 1. The expected value is 1 half. But on the other hand, when you look at minimum cost matchings, where you would like to put this particular job is to perhaps the machine where the cost is the least, or thereabouts. The minimum across all the possible machines for a particular job is of the order 1 by n. So whereas the typical uh, edge is of cost uh, 1. And therefore, perhaps only uh, links of uh, cost order of 1 by n matter. Maybe we can restrict attention to those and see what happens. And indeed, that's exactly, uh, uh, that is the key to this, uh, uh, to why belief propagation algorithm has a chance to work in this setting. Let us say that we erase all links that cost more than, let's say, a conservative 10,000 or 100,000 by n. Okay, that's of the order of 1 by n, but a large constant. And the picture that one gets. Uh, so all of these are essentially of the order 1 by n. All these weights are of the order 1 by n. So maybe we'll rescale them back, multiply them by n, so that they are all now of the order 1. The picture that one gets from j, from the node j, looks something like this, okay, which is uh, tree-like. In other words, loops are of the order, uh, the length of loops are essentially of the order. So where I think of a length of a loop in terms of the costs involved in passing through those edges. Lengths of loops are of the order of uh, 1, whereas uh, what we are interested in is in a scale which is of the order 1 by n. OK, 
Okay, and in that scale, things do look like a tree. And therefore, our algorithm, belief propagation algorithm, has a chance of success. So one can formalize this notion, and uh, uh, there is a limiting object that one can come up with, and a complete description of this limiting object. But we'll not uh, get into that uh, uh, here. Loops go away. So that's the first message that I want to, I want you to, uh, um, I want you to recognize. But then when we let the network become large, uh, there is a new and a bigger problem that emerges. And this uh, bigger problem is of the following nature. Um, for any local algorithm uh, to work, uh, things that happen very far away ought not to affect your decisions locally around this node. So here is node i. And uh, we are essentially going to make an, a decision on the posterior there based on local interactions. You may do a certain number of iterations, so that will capture information from a small neighborhood. But that's all it will capture. Maybe you can increase this marginally, but it can't scale with the network size. So as a consequence, what's going to happen is that if your problem has this property that there is long range dependence, things at the boundary affect decisions here in a dramatic way, then you can't hope for a local algorithm to uh, capture, this, uh, uh, capture this effect. So for belief propagation to succeed, you must have this property called correlation decay. There are very many notions of this, uh, uh, of this uh, correlation decay. For example, in uh, random processes, there is this notion of mixing. And that's a Greek alphabet soup of, uh, of notions of mixing. There are, there are very similar notions here as well. So here, here I give one example. Uh, for example, uh, sub, as the distance between this node where I'm doing a local operation and the boundary. So this is the set B, and this is the boundary. So let's say that we fix the values at the boundary to some specific value. As the distance between this node and the boundary goes to infinity, if I have two different fixes of the boundary condition, and I look at the marginal here. If the marginals dramatically differ, and I'm in trouble, and the notion of correlation, one notion of correlation decay says that this maximum across all the boundary conditions must essentially go to 0 in some sense. Okay. So this is one qualitative notion. You can come up with quantitative notions as well. So at what rate does it go to 0? And there are other qualitative uh, as well as quantitative uh, notions of correlation decay. But that is an entirely. Uh, uh, deep subject, uh, and uh, a study of that uh, involves the specific nature of the problem that we are looking at. So here we are essentially looking at matching, um, and it also depends on the parameters of the problem. So one can ask, is there correlation decay in this matching problem? One can ask, is there correlation decay in other versions of the matching problem? Or in other problems, in, for example, the independent set problem, another uh, hard problem in a hard problem in computer science and perhaps for some parameter ranges, and so on. And the answers turn out to be different for each of these different things. And that's where a lot of intricacy lies. So uh, one must essentially have correlation decay to have a belief propagation algorithm to succeed. So uh, with those two notions uh, that I have introduced, I'll come to the summary of this talk. Uh, so belief propagation is an iterative and local algorithm for computing the marginal probabilities of a graphical probability model. It's amenable to distributed implementation. Two conditions are generally needed for you to guarantee that BP works. And that is uh, locally tree-like. And the other notion on which I spent uh, only a, a slide, that's correlation decay. There are huge application domains in statistical physics where it originated as something called Bether pearls approximation. In artificial intelligence for computing beliefs, posterior beliefs, etc. In optimization, and I gave you an example of that, and of course it's been used in uh, big data settings as well. And uh, in signal processing, it, uh, it's essentially all over the place. For example, many of you may recognize these Viterbi algorithm, the uh, Behel, Koch, uh, Elinek, and Raviv algorithm. That's essentially computing the marginal of a hidden Markov model. Iterative decoding of error correcting codes and Kalman filters. So all of these are essentially instantiations of belief propagation. On some sim somewhat simpler settings. So uh, with that, I would like to end the talk. Uh, thank you for your attention. Questions or comments? 
Yes. Can you go back to the transportation problem, mission, sir, assignment problem? Assignment sir, problem. though we all know you, please, please introduce yourself. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I'm Vishwanatham, a retired professor from computer science and automation. I'm an insult senior scientist. Yes. Now here, uh, the big data problem is supposing the jobs as well as the machines can talk. Okay. In other words, machines have embedded chips and jobs have tagged. But then, you know, uh, the job can say, you know, look, uh, if I am assigned first, I can pay you three times. And the machine can say, look, I don't have the tool that to process you so fast or something like that. Then what happens to this problem? What, um, That's the big data problem right now. I was discussing with Arnab the other day. Okay, I didn't know that. Uh, but. Uh, um, so this is the first time I'm uh, thinking of this problem. And I can come up with a, a, a I mean, prima facie, I can say that perhaps uh, there is a modification to the existing setup uh, that one can come up with, um, a, a sort of additional terms that one introduces into this relaxation that ought to take into account some of the issues that you're suggesting. Like, for example, uh, there is an, in addition to this cost, there is an extra payment factor that comes into the picture, some incentive that each of these jobs can give to this machine. So I have a feeling that that can be incorporated yeah, I mean, If here. you want, I can give you more physical yeah. uh, physics uh, of the corresponding problem. And it will be a good contribution to the factory for scheduling. Okay. Uh, you can add that uh, okay. to you, the list. <laughs> Thank you. OK. So there was a question, question there. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I am Srinivas Karthik, from first year PhD student from CSA. So my question is, uh, uh, what is the uh, intuition for of this Netflix problem? Uh, you know, using uh, this uh, belief propagation for the Netflix problem. Okay, uh, so it's an optimization problem. So we essentially uh, maybe let me go to that optimization problem here. So here's the optimization problem. It's actually amenable to this kind. So the thing that you need in order to be able to uh, uh, separate out the computations is you need a product form. Okay. So if you look at each of these, those are the Frobenius norms. So that's the sum of all of these terms. And so is this. Okay, so is this. Because when, when you look at this, this, all of these are essentially sum terms. So when you exponentiate this with a beta parameter, you can essentially come up with a very similar formulation that we did for the random assignment. And now, you can try to go and find out what the assignments must be. These might be now real values, or maybe some, yeah, in this case, they're real values. So you, look, you now look for distributions instead of just uh, beliefs of 1 or 0. Okay. So you now look for a distribution. But the formulation is essentially the same. OK, or in some sense, uh, is it saying that two users, if they have the same ratings, I want to propagate the uh, ratings for the other ah, one? So your, your question is? Um, one of how do you interpret the beliefs yeah, that yeah, come about? Right. Okay, I have to think about that. Um, let, let me see. Um, okay, so is it done? Yeah, Maybe thanks, I'll, huh? I'll think about it and answer offline. Yeah. Right. There's a question there back. How sensitive is your model with respect to the choice of co cost functions or the beta? For the beta, okay. So uh, that's an interesting question. Um, so sensitive in what sense? That's the, uh, like for example, you can ask for various values of beta. Let me go back here, or go forward to this. OK, so for various values of beta, you can ask, is there this notion of correlation decay? Is that, is that an appropriate question to ask? So that's or, one or, question that one can Or ask. is there a critical beta beyond which you have a okay. uh, dense tree-like structure? OK, so it is uh, believed that that is, uh, the critical beta is 0. In other words, okay. essentially, uh, one, one believes to uh, see this. Uh, one believes that there is a unique solution for all values of beta. Now, what I do know is that uh, uh, there was a paper. As of uh, 2003, uh, it was still open. I don't know if there has been some subsequent work which has essentially resolved this question, if it is indeed, uh, if the solution is unique uh, across all beta. 
But what we do know is that uh, something special happens at beta equal to 0. And there, indeed, this kind of uniqueness does hold. But we don't have a, a proof for all beta. OK, can we introduce yourself? Question? Yes. Hi. So before uh, you ask the question, the last question should come from this side. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Shivani Agarwal, uh, faculty at IIC. Uh, so Rajesh, maybe just for the benefit of those um, undergraduate students who are joining us in the audience today, or those who are coming from more of an applications perspective, perhaps you could give me a slightly broad picture of uh, what types of problems or applications ah. could benefit from these kinds of approaches, in particular, um, where you could scale up computations using these approaches, where it might not be feasible with other traditional uh, techniques. OK, so useful. for example, this one data set problem is, is an example where you can uh, essentially use uh, this technique. SAT solvers are, essentially, are another example where you can use uh, these ideas to come up with, uh, uh, come up with uh, assignments for variables that meet some, uh, that satisfy certain requirements. Um, examples where these are actually used abound. For example, your cell phones, if you download data for all the undergraduates, uh, if you download uh, data, then uh, you're actually using the sum product algorithm uh, in a very essential way for every bit, for every packet that, that you receive. Um, uh, even if you don't, don't download data for your voice communication, you essentially use this Viterbi algorithm. And all of these essentially happen because you, one could parallelize and implement this in hardware. And that's what essentially resulted in the revolution of uh, getting these error correcting codes onto these phones and uh, resilience of our uh, algorithms to errors. So it's because of uh, this avatars of this belief propagation algorithm. Uh, I don't know if I have answered, given enough examples to satisfy you, but uh, so your phones use it all the time when you download it. So the last question from this side. There has to be a question from this side. Uh, yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> so any questions from this side? Or we want to make him move? So I'll face you so that you can <laughs> ask a question. Oh, there's a question for yeah. you. Uh, is there a question? Yeah. Hello, I'm Pradeep at uh, SSAME student. Actually, you talked about correlation and decay happening to reduce the boundary effects. Yes. Can it also affect local property? I mean, as you keep moving in, your local property may destroy. I mean, um, can it affect? Uh, sorry, is there an is there a local? Sorry, can you repeat the yeah, question? From Maybe boundary, you're coming in, and you are saying correlation decay to. I mean. Your algorithm works for local property. Right? Yeah, so this is essentially a local algorithm. Things far away, if they affect my decisions, if they ought to affect my decision, that's something about the nature of the problem. Uh, if they ought to affect, then your local algorithm will not capture it. That's the point I was trying to make. But I didn't capture your question, so maybe. Yeah. Uh, As you keep moving in towards the center, let's say, in the graph, uh -huh. And you're saying correlation is decreasing. No, no, no. Uh, so the correlation decreases as the distance of the boundary from this point where you're essentially computing the marginal increases. So as the boundary gets further and further away, what we would like is the correlation to decay. So boundary effects must be negligible at this point. Okay. So, yes. Okay. Hello, I'm Rishi from IBM. So does this correlation decay, um, does it have any relation to let's say what Arnab talk, talked about, the conductance of the graph, and let's say the spectral nature of the graph? Looks like offline. It, um, it, I'm sorry. Uh, sorry? <laughs> <laughs> so he knows about this more than I do. So what's, uh, what's your take on the answer? Uh, so, so what is the question again that? Uh, uh, does this property I, have? I, OK, maybe. Uh, I, I think it does, but I'm unable to articulate what the connection might be. Um, so. But it's, uh, just to add to that, yeah. see, whatever I understand is uh, he started to put the optimization viewpoint. And the correctness will lie if BP will converge, right? So BP will only converge, as he's trying to show in a slide, that if things look like a tree. So wherever there are small cycles, whatever you do, you'll be lost, right? So well, that's the best. Uh, 
think I can say so expanders have those properties. Hmm? Lo expanders are locally trees. Look, uh, so those kind of things might be a possibility, but anyway, uh, that's a matter of research. Yes. Uh, so we had a last question. Uh, perhaps we can take this question yeah. offline. I'll have to think about this a bit. Manjunath had a yeah, question. Yeah. Uh. No, I was just about to ask something. He remarked about uh, what this local, uh, huh. so, uh, if it is not tree like, so you gave some example, pathological example, but. Uh, and there are no theorems that this belief propagation converges, but are there good situations where it actually does? Yes. So this is something that I did not uh, uh, elaborate on here. It turns out that for this particular matching problem, under some conditions, uh, let me go back to PP for optimization, optimal assignment. So here is a setup where you can essentially go directly to a belief propagation algorithm for this. It turns out that in this, for this problem, if the optimal matching is something that's unique, belief propagation will pull out the correct answer. But the number of iterations that it needs is a lot more. And the, um, the reason why it uh, pulls this answer out is something that's, uh, that requires a study of the computation tree in computing these uh, quantity, in computing these beliefs. So somehow there is a certain tree-like structure over there that doesn't affect uh, uh, the, the, uh, and as a consequence, <laughs> loops don't enter into the picture in that computation. But uh, this is not something that I have a full understanding about. But yes, there are settings, and I can enumerate some of them, where belief propagation works, even if you have uh, uh, loops. But then you need some special conditions. For example, here, uh, the condition that is needed is that it's unique. The solution is unique. The minimum cost thing is unique. There are some other alternative conditions also in terms of the uh, things that uh, you, you can write this as an LP. The matching problem, you can write it as an LP. And that LP, uh, uh, the linear, that linear program, if that matrix has some special properties, then once again, you can say something about uh, belief propagation's convergence there. So let's thank, leave it at that. let's thank the speaker once more. So may I? So may I request Professor Anurag Kumar to give the speaker a sh small present? Thanks. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Two announcements. Uh, for students, no going home for summer because 23rd we have another lecture, May 23rd. Okay. Uh, maybe we'll uh, serve uh, some cool drinks there if the chairman agrees. And as of now, there is some tea and snacks outside. So please join us. Thank you.